The railways built America. Aha! Hauling hundreds of thousands of tons of coal. That's how much it takes to power America. One of America's toughest lines. This is extreme. Leads to the country's most important power plants. That's awesome. My name is Matt Baum. Ever since I was a kid, I've been obsessed with trains. My day job, I work on a railroad in Maine. But this is my dream. To ride the biggest, fastest, most awesome trains in history. the Console Energy Bailey Prep Plant in Greene County, Pennsylvania. We're gonna load one of America's most important commodities into one of our country's most important trains. Coal is the fuel that powers America. Over half its electricity comes from 600 coal-fired power plants. Every year, over one billion tons of coal are dug up and hauled across America. That's enough to fill a train 94,000 miles long. If the coal doesn't reach the power plants, America goes dark. One of the most important rail links is the Norfolk Southern. This isn't just any train. These Norfolk Southern coal trains can be up to and over 130 cars. That's 18,000 tons of train. That's a lot of responsibility for the engineer that has to haul this train over that track. 300 miles of crucial and often treacherous rail running from the coal mines of Greene County, Pennsylvania, to the power plant in Washingtonville. It's millions of cars of coal, just like this one, moving across America's rail lines. Man, that's a lot of coal. This is the Bailey Central Preparation Plant. It gets raw coal from two nearby mines via a system of underground conveyor belts nine miles long, where the whole process starts. This conveyor belt here is about 1,000 feet, and it's running about 750 feet a minute. Here, the raw coal is sorted and washed. Then it's broken down so much that you wouldn't even recognize it. Now, if I stuck my hand in there, what would happen? You're going to feel it's just like water to you. Can I do that? Yes, you can. It feels like uh, water and air. <laughs> it feels nasty, first of all, but it, yeah, it feels like foam. It's really gross. The dried coal is stored in silos until it's ready to be loaded onto the train and freighted out. The line of coal cars leaving this plant every day stretches for six miles. This is the finished product. We're up power. I get energy right in my hands. This is the stuff that's going to go on our train. Before they can move, 15,000 tons of coal needs to be loaded. This track goes right underneath the loading silo where the cars are filled with coal before they go on their 300-mile journey to the power plant. I want to see what's going on up there. Let's go check it out. Every year, the Bailey plant produces over 20 million tons of coal. Conveyor belts bring the coal to this loading facility. A locomotive pulls empty carriages at a steady 0.4 miles per hour underneath this coal chute. When the car is lined up, the chute opens and out comes the coal. Each open-top aluminium carriage holds 120 tons of coal. They treat it at the plant up there, clean it, so it comes down here and gets loaded. Randy lines up the chute and releases the coal. You're doing this with the, with yes. the joystick. You ever, yes. get, you ever get Atari thumb from the joystick? Well, good question. Good question. <laughs> 
In America, hauling coal is a $1.2 billion business. So Norfolk Southern track every single car all the way from the mine to the power plant. This thing right here is a reader. What it does is, is it reads a tag on the side of the car right here. It's kind of like when you go to the grocery store with a bag of chips and they scan it on the UPC. That tag will tell a computer where this car is anywhere in America. Other details about each carriage are just as important, like how much it weighs. An overloaded train on the steep gradients of the Alleghenies could mean a runaway train and disaster. Right here, we have the car scale. What it does is the train comes into the coal plant, it weighs the empty car, so they know how much coal to put in it when they're loading it. It's very sensitive. So if I jump up on this car right here, they can tell you how much I weigh inside, but I don't really want to tell you that right now. He's loaded 8,428 tons to this train, and that's just the coal. It doesn't even include how much the car weighs. And he's at 71. He still has about 35 cars to go. Norfolk Southern has a fleet of more than 35,000 carriages, and they have to make sure that the coal is the only thing they're carrying. I notice he's over here looking at a uh, screen, seeing what's in the car, right? Correct. Do you guys ever find anything else in there, like boards or tires or? Well, we've found soccer balls, baseballs, bicycles, and even humans. Ooh, I don't think we want to talk about that. <laughs> I figured that you guys had found bodies in there before. Well, he was live. Oh, it was alive, the hobo? The, the, yes. Yeah. Was, yes. Yeah, he was drunk and passed out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Randy, I got to admit, you're making this look pretty easy. Can I give it a try? Sure, yeah. All right. I mean, if you spill, you got a shovel, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what the cameraman's for. <laughs> Coal has been burned for heat and fuel for thousands of years. But it was the Industrial Revolution and the invention of the coal-fired steam train in the early 1800s that sparked a huge demand for coal in America. By the 1880s, coal was being used to make electricity for homes and factories, too. Being cheap and plentiful, coal soon became a leading source of energy. To load coal into the carriages takes skill and precision, even with the sophisticated machinery now available. Now you start lowering it, keep going, and then you go to your left and that'll open the gate. Now go ahead and lower it more. Right there. And then once it comes up against the rubber, you'll want to raise it maybe six, eight inches. Okay. Raising the chute to the correct height is important. If it's too low, it can damage the edge of the carriage. If it's too high, coal will spill out. That's it. You're doing good. First time loading. You gotta pay attention yeah. for sure. All right, this is it. The train's loaded. We're going to take this coal to the power plant. Toot toot. What could possibly go wrong? In Greene County, Pennsylvania, this coal train is about to set off on one of America's most challenging rail routes, destined for the Washingtonville power plant. And the railroad that's going to get us there is Norfolk Southern, the thoroughbred of transportation. The crew, Larry and Stan, have plenty of experience. They are both well-qualified engineers. If anyone can manage this route, they can. Thanks for having me on board. Nice to meet you. So where are we heading today, boys? Horseshoe Curve. Horseshoe Curve. Wait, wait, wait. You just said Horseshoe Curve? Yeah. We're going to go around the Horseshoe Curve? We're going around the Horseshoe Curve. I've always wanted to go around the Horseshoe Curve. This is great. I can't wait. This route takes us through Pittsburgh and Johnstown before soaring 1,716 feet over the Allegheny Ridge, where a marvel of modern engineering takes us around a 220-degree bend called the Horseshoe Curve. We pass through the rail town of Altoona before delivering 15,000 tons of coal to the power plant in Washingtonville. So we're going over some challenging territory. Uh, yeah, it's challenging, especially the hill. That's, that's the best part of it. All right, guys, let's get this train rolling. I can't wait. Get the show on the road. Taking on these mountains and the horseshoe curve will be tough for any train. 
So you just lifted 15,000 tons with your fingertips. Roger. How's that feel? I like it. it must make you feel kind of Slowly, the train moves out of the yard. All right, the rear end is clear of the yard, so that means the whole train's out of the main line. It's hammer time. Before getting to any rugged terrain, this huge load has to trundle through the middle of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. OK, yep. This bridge is huge. It's going to be more than a half mile long. Oh. Known as the Steel City. Right now, we're crossing the Ohio River, coming into Pittsburgh. Through the 1900s, it was coal that powered the factories that made Pittsburgh famous. Millions of tons of coal pass through this city every year. It takes patience, skill, and something train engineers call instinct to get this mile-long train through the mountains. Larry is over here driving the train, or running the train. That's the more technical term. And he's got all kinds of levers, and there's a lot of machinery he's working. What people might not realize is that being an engineer takes a little more than that. There's a thing called instinct. He can feel every little vibration, every little push, every little pull this train is doing right here in the seat. Too much vibration is a warning sign to the engineer. It means the speed of the train needs to be adjusted. And he can anticipate what move to make. It's almost like a game of chess, where he's going to be about four or five moves ahead of where he is right now. And I'll tell you what, Larry's a darn good engineer. I've ridden with a lot of engineers in my lifetime. And smooth. Smooth still. Yep, yeah, it's very smooth. Johnstown was the site of one of the biggest disasters in American history. In 1889, it was booming and had a population of 30,000. But on May the 31st of that year, a huge dam 14 miles north of the town burst. 20 million tons of water came crashing down the little Connemore River. A 40-foot high wave smashed into Johnstown, washing away homes, factories, and huge steam locomotives. Over 2,200 people died in the flood, and even more were left homeless. First to the rescue was the Pennsylvania Railroad. In three days, new tracks were laid, enabling food, supplies, and help to be brought in by train. This mountain, this rail line, it's no joke. There's some serious business here. And a serious challenge. Early railroad pioneers found the Alleghenies much too steep to climb. And that's not good news when you've got 15,000 tons of coal behind you that's waiting to power the whole East Coast. That's correct. Have you ever thought of it that way? You're, you're, you're pulling electricity behind you, man. It may not look so steep, but getting over the ridge is not going to be easy with all this weight. The gradient that the train needs to climb is a serious obstacle. The gradient is the degree to which the track goes up or down. If the track rises one foot over a distance of 100 feet, it's a 1% gradient. Most railways consider a 2% gradient to be very steep. In the Alleghenies, they often rise above 2%, so there's no way a huge train like this can get through on its own. For a 15,000 ton coal train to get up and over these mountains, help is needed. Hey, this is it. We're coming into Johnstown. We're going to put the helpers on. A helper is an engine that provides the extra push to get a huge load up a steep gradient. I want to see how this works. I'm going to go ride the helpers. The two helpers add over 6,000 horsepower to our existing engines, a total of 21,000 horsepower. It's like having 26 NASCAR engines running a full capacity. OK, we're on the helpers. We're getting ready to hook onto the rear of the train and give it a push.
these two helper locomotives will push the coal train over the Alleghenies to Altoona. So the helper crew is now in sync with the head end crew, correct? You've done your brake test. Everything is the same. And you guys are going to push now, right? Yes. Push away. Push away, John. Right. All right. To make it up and over this mountain, Norfolk Southern is going to use six engines. Six engines. You hear that right here behind me? These engines are using all the power they have to make it up and over this mountain. Wow, you guys really put these engines through their paces. This is unreal. The helper crews are in constant radio contact with the lead crew who are running the locomotive at the front of the train. They'll tell us just how much help is needed. Right now, it's close to full throttle. I can feel it. We're kind of we're bearing down now. Yeah, we're bearing down. This thing's really starting to push now. You can feel it in the seat. We must be getting pretty close to the top because I can really feel it. These engines are pushing hard. We're slowing down. Are you scared? Yeah. <laughs> I am. It's hard enough to get a train safely to its destination on a straight track. These inclines take it to another level. So we're actually going to have the head end going down the hill, and we're still going to be still pushing. Be going up the hill, yeah. That's amazing. Yes. That takes a lot of skill. With the head end over the mountain, John is performing a delicate balancing act. Pushing too hard could cause the lead locomotive to lose control. Not pushing hard enough means not making it. We're in full throttle right now. We're at 10 miles an hour, right on our knees, just pushing against this train. This is extreme. This is crazy. And you're not scared. We've got about four miles to go. This is just like being on a roller coaster going up to the top. Getting over the Allegheny Ridge would push any train engine to its limits. Breaking down up here is not an option. Every locomotive on this track has been put through extensive testing. This is the Juniata Locomotive Facility. It's one of the oldest locomotive shops in the country. When Norfolk Southern needs to do an engine overhaul, they bring their engines here. This place is huge. Juniata in Altoona covers a total of 30 acres. It's one of the busiest train workshops in the world. They service 300 to 500 locomotives here per year. Juniata can handle any kind of repair. One of the unique things about the Juniata locomotive shop is that other rail companies will send their engines here to get fixed because the work here is so good. I just pressed that button, Jeff. That's 750 horsepower right there. Right. This is a new one right here. Look at that. Beautiful. A giant turntable makes sure the right engines end up in the right bay. I notice there's a speed button there. Can it speed. really, really go fast? We can crank her the whole way up can, if you like. Can you scratch like in a rap video on the turntable? Yes, we can. <laughs> They have another way to move locomotives from shop to shop. This is amazing. This 200-ton crane has lifted this 390,000-pound locomotive. It's moving it from over there to over here so they can work on it. Try doing that at the gym. A three-man crew attaches an overhead crane. This single overhead crane can lift over 200 tons. Once everything is in place, the whole engine can be lifted. With the push of a button, the huge locomotive is hoisted 15 meters into the air. A 200-ton engine that looks like it's levitating. Mm -hmm. 
It can then be moved to whichever shop they want. Only fully serviced engines are allowed to tackle the steep inclines of the Allegheny Mountains. They told us they've got a clear signal, and we're about to go over the top of the mountain. This is it. I can feel it. That's your seatbelt. <laughs> That's not very encouraging. There are no seatbelts. This helper on the Norfolk Southern coal train is pushing 15,000 tons of coal to a power plant on the other side of the Allegheny Mountains in western Pennsylvania. In the 1850s, the Pennsylvania Railroad had a problem. The route across the Alleghenies led over a pass into a steep-sided valley, and then over another pass. The gradient in and out of the valley were far too steep for a train. So the Pennsylvania Railroad built tracks around the head of the valley in a huge curve shaped like a horseshoe. The horseshoe curve is one of the great engineering feats of the 19th century. The Pennsylvania Railroad brought in thousands of immigrants to build the curve. These guys were only getting paid 25 cents an hour to build their piece of the American dream. If it wasn't for these guys and their raw muscle, this railroad would have never been here. In 1854, the Horseshoe Curve was completed. With the aid of helper locomotives, trains climbed over the pass, then down into the curve track around the head of the valley. Because the curve itself is on a gradual incline, the train can go faster and remain under control. Out of the curve, the train still has enough momentum to get over the next mountain pass. When the Horseshoe Curve opened in 1854, the trip from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia was cut from three and a half days to just 12 hours. All this stuff right here, pushing the train up over the mountain, bringing it down the mountain, guys like John and Ron here, it's all about getting the coal to the power plant. So what do you think's harder as a pusher crew? Is it harder going up the hill or harder going down the hill? Going down the hill. Going down the hill. I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> the helper is still pushing the rear of the train up the mountain, but the lead locomotives have already begun their descent. So more than half the train is going down the hill right now. Yes. And I noticed that you've throttled off, so it's kind of starting to pull us now. We're going over the top right now. You can see it right there, how it's gone up, and now we're going down. This is where the craziness begins. It's all downhill from here. Approaching the horseshoe curve, the brakes need to be in good working order. Trains have been making this journey for over 150 years. A railway museum is the best place to find out how steam trains were able to stop. In the 1830s, if you wanted to stop an engine, a railroad employee would get in front of it, dig his boots into the ground, stop it with his heels. But when the railroad started making engines this big right here, they had to come up with another way, and that's when they invented the brake shoe. Brake shoes work by pressing against the wheel. There's a lot of friction involved to stop this train, a lot of wear and tear on these brake shoes. Just like on your car, you gotta have them serviced once in a while. A locomotive like this would have its brake shoes inspected every day. Looks like that's what Mike's doing right now. Let's go down and take a look. Mike, what's going on? Oh, uh, we have to change this brake shoe out, Matt. It's bad. For what? one, it's worn out, and now it's got a big crack in it, and you can't have a defect like that on your brakes. Okay, I can see the crack right here. There's a nice big crack in there, so we have a defective brake shoe, and uh, Mike's going to change it out. Unless you want to do it, Matt. I'll tell you what, Mike. I'll, t I'll take a crack at it. Far and make some room here so we can get it out. Watch my head, I just about Yeah, watch your head. head. A lot of places to bang your head around here. So I'm gonna just stick this in. Ah, okay. Push it back. That's pretty loose in here, so we can just take it out by hand. All right. So now you wanna lift the shoe off of there. It doesn't feel very na natural. No. Uh, lift it back. Here, let's see if we can pop it out for you. 
How's that? All right, yeah. Sort of let it slide down the chute. There you go. Hi. Right. We'll, right, we'll get that we'll later. Right into the pit. I have a feeling we're going to be going down there a little later anyway. <laughs> I hope there wasn't anybody down there. We have this brand new brake shoe here. Back in the day, how, how long would one of these brake shoes last? You might get 10,000 miles out of a set of shoes. Any kind of warranty on that? No warranty. All right. These marks here are indicators on when to change the brake shoe. When they wear down, it means it's time to change it. Okay, so we're going to take this 25-pound brake shoe. I'm going to start it up at the top of the wheel here. Yes. Yeah. Let's slide this. Slide this. Steam train engineering took a lot of hard labor. Yeah. Ready? All right. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. All right. I think you got it. I think I got it. Oh, I can feel it tight yeah. right up there. And then you just tap it right in. And that's it. If the brakes don't work, you're looking at a train wreck. Trains still have brake shoes. But there are new techniques to help deal with the stretches of track, like the Allegheny Ridge. This train uses dynamic braking. Dynamic braking uses the engine's traction motors to slow the train down. When dynamic braking is engaged, the engineer takes power from the motors that drive the train wheels. The resistance in the engine makes the wheels harder to turn, effectively slowing the wheels and the speed of the train. It's like putting your car into low gear, letting the resistance of the engine hold the train back. You've just come out of dynamic braking. What, what were you doing? Uh, what we were doing is we were holding the, the train back in the dynamic brake. So he was holding them back from the front end, and we were holding them back from the rear. And then once the brakes take hold, I slowly leave my dynamic brake off. And now we're just going along for the ride, more or less. Running this train through the Alleghenies is a constant struggle between man and nature, train versus gravity. But your job's not over, is it? It's never over. <laughs> History has shown that even experienced crews have fallen prey to the hazards of the Alleghenies, especially on the descent. In 1925, a 58-carriage freight train lost braking power on the steepest section of the descent into the Horseshoe Curve, derailing the train and killing two crewmen. In 1947, the eastbound Red Arrow train derailed just west of Horseshoe Curve and rolled down the mountain. 24 people were killed and 126 injured. Our train enters the Horseshoe Curve. That is incredible! Norfolk Southern coal train route through western Pennsylvania is an amazing 220 degree bend called the Horseshoe Curve. I've always wanted to go around Horseshoe Curve. This is incredible. The Horseshoe Curve is half a mile long, which is why we can see the other end of our mile long train from the engineer's window. It's directly on the other side of us. That is incredible. In 1966, the Horseshoe Curve was designated a National Historic Landmark. And every year, over a half a million people come to watch 15,000 ton trains, like ours, whip around the curve. Since the 1850s, this route has been a vital artery, linking the resource-rich hills of western Pennsylvania to the east coast. So important, in fact, that in the Second World War, the Horseshoe Curve became the target of a Nazi bombing plot. In 1942, eight Nazi agents set out to destroy American supply lines to the east coast. The idea was to cripple cities like New York and Washington and bring the country to its knees. The plot was only foiled when two of the German agents turned themselves in to the FBI. 
The dangers facing today's crews aren't the stuff of espionage, but they're just as scary. The steep gradients and heavy traffic along this route mean a daily hammering of steel wheels and steel rails. In fact, more than 70 trains per day use the curve. With that comes the constant threat of a derailment, so Norfolk Southern need to make sure that this curved rail is in top condition. We're here at Bennington Curve in Altoona, Pennsylvania with one of Norfolk Southern's rail gangs. What they're doing is they're replacing the track. All this equipment you see here is gonna be used to replace this rail. Because of the effects of centripetal force, curved tracks need more maintenance than straight ones. When a 15,000-ton train whips through a curve, more of its weight presses against the outside rail, causing a lot more wear and tear. The first thing the rail gang does is they pull the spikes up. That's what this machine is doing right here. Look at that, he's pulling the spikes right out. Once the spikes are out, another team fills the holes. What's going on here? This looks like you're squirting mustard or something. But it's not really mustard, is it? No. It's actually an epoxy glue that hardens and helps the hole keep its shape until the new spikes are put back in. Can I give it a try? Sure. This stuff hardens in seconds, so you've got to be quick and have a good aim. Otherwise, the gun will clog up with dried glue. OK. What hole am I looking for here? Just the two. This, these two, two? Empty holes. All right. And when it fills up, just pull away? Yep. That didn't look good. You got to keep squirting, or it'll harden up inside there. Oh. Oh. Too late. <laughs> so what do you have to do if it hardens up? The glue hardened and the gun blocked. It's not as easy as it looks. This section of the rail gang replaces old rails with new ones. This guy has to put thousands of pounds of steel rail just in the right spot. This is a precision job. Is it harder to work on straight track or curved track? Well, it, it creates more pressure in a curve, so that gives us more problems with the rail wanting to move on it. Creating curved rail is a precise operation. The crew needs to make sure that the new rail is in exactly the same place as the old rail it's replacing. So he goes back and forth between the new rail and the, the old rail that you're pulling out. The Bennington curve looks like it's pretty sharp, it, it so is you guys, you have your hands full today. Once the new rail is in place, it's heated to minimize expansion and contraction when the weather changes. New spikes keep the rail in place. The machine's doing the work, but he's lining it up with his eyes. If he messes, the spike's gonna fly. For every mile of rail, there are 10,000 spikes, each weighing less than half a kilo. Replacing them requires precision. This machine sure be pounding it with a hammer, that's for sure. The rail gang need to know what they're doing. If a steel spike went flying, it would be very dangerous. So you're doing that all by yourself. If you're looking at it. Right, you're shooting the hole. No, you're keeping the spike in the hole. Right? You ever miss? Well, yeah. <laughs> what happens when you miss? Well, she shoots. You know? <laughs> or you bend them or whatever. Well, I've been watching you and you haven't missed. Well, unreal. Here's the practice. Here's the practice. Not only the rails get worn down, but the train's wheels take a beating too. To see how the experts deal with broken wheels, we've come to the rail yard that changes more wheels than any other yard in America. Union Pacific's Bailey Yard in North Platte, Nebraska. These guys have encountered a problem. They have a wheel with flat spots on it. Now, flat spots, you may have heard them. Train goes by, you hear the ka-clunk, 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 ka-clunk. Well, this is what this wheel has. It's bad for the wheel. It's bad for the tracks. These guys say they can change it out in five minutes without setting the car out of the train. They're going to do it right here. Five minutes. Let's see if they can do it. 
This jack is bringing the cars right off the ground. It's lifting the chassis right up in the air. They've rolled the bad wheel out. This is amazing. Those hydraulic jacks are rated for 50 tons. That's how they can lift that huge carriage and hold it up there for so long. Two minutes. They've rolled the old wheel out. They've got the new wheel on standby over here. The crew needs to set the new wheel in exactly the right place. These wheels aren't connected at all to the train. They just ride on the truck there, bringing the new wheel in. When they lower the steel car back into place, the new wheels will fit into the groove just like a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. Three minutes. They've taken the bad wheel out. Now they have the new wheel. They're going to roll it underneath the truck. Lower the jack, and the wheel's going to be changed. <laughs> 60 seconds left. The only thing they have left to do is get the hydraulic jack back out. Changing a coal carriage's wheels used to take two weeks, but here they make it look like changing a bike tire. Absolutely incredible. Four and a half minutes. They changed this wheel out right here in four and a half minutes. Even NASCAR pit crews have come down to check out how these guys do the work. This train is now ready to go. Expert maintenance of both the track and the wheels means Norfolk Southern coal trains make it through the Allegheny Mountains in one piece. We made it over the mountain, through the tunnel, around the curve. You guys are the greatest, man. Thanks. You're very welcome. Here we are in Altoona. We're going to cut the helpers off. I'm going to head to the head end. Hey, thanks a lot, Ron. Back in the lead locomotive, on the way to deliver the coal that powers Pennsylvania, one final challenge remains. Once the horseshoe curve was complete, trains could cross the Allegheny Mountains more easily and in greater numbers. By the mid-20th century, coal mining had gone from a budding industry to the lifeblood of a nation. America's status in economic history was due in large part to coal energy and the trains that carried it. 15,000 tons of coal train has weathered the steep climb into the Allegheny Mountains and survived the plunge through the Horseshoe Curve to arrive at the PPL power plant in Washingtonville. This is where the coal becomes electricity. All right, we finally made it. Now the next thing to do is get the coal off the train into PPL's boilers. That's what it's all about. If it's not burned right away, it comes here to the coal reserves. All this coal you see here is only about a month's worth of supply. That's how much it takes to power America, and that's why it's vital that this train gets unloaded fast. Carriages used to be unloaded manually, either by tipping them over or unloading them from the bottom. These carriages are equipped for what is called rotary dumping. They have been unhooked from the engine and have entered the rotary dumper. You actually can move the train with this? That's correct, yes. So it's like having uh, a full-scale train set. That's right, just by a push of a button. All right, can you show me how this works? Sure. OK, that's what moves it. All right. The huge machine takes over, and a set of hydraulic cylinders push the mile-long line of carriages towards the dumper. So that car's out on the rotary dump right now. That's going on to the dumper, yep. Oh, it'll be geez. moving all by itself. <laughs> wow, look at that. <laughs> These hydraulic cylinders pack a punch of 250,000 pounds of force. That by itself is going to move the entire train. The cylinders are so powerful, the train doesn't even need an engineer. The train comes into this shed here. That's right. You lock the car down, and then there's a car on the rotary dump. That's right. The rotary dump turns, the 
cold dumps out. Great. So how long does it take, Randy, to unload an entire train of, say, 105 cars? 105 cars, about four hours. In four hours, the entire train will be emptied and ready to go back for more coal. So that's really, really fast. Yeah, it's a lot faster than shoveling, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the coal carriages are connected to one another by what are called rotary couplers. These couplers allow each car to be rotated by the coal dumper while still connected to the train. So that rotary dump is going to take 120 tons of coal, tip it over, and dump it out in one move. It makes the coal dumping process much more efficient. The coal pours out, and it goes to the plant. That's right. And then you're powering a million homes. That's right. Do you realize how much power you actually have here? That's a lot. Just, <laughs> just in you know, it's hard to fathom it, you know, what, it, what we can generate here. Yeah. This power plant uses over 4 million tons of coal each year. Wow! That's a lot of coal! That's awesome! You're going to actually let me do this? That's right. OK. So I've loaded coal, and now I'm going to dump it. coming down. OK. All right, all right. And okay. then just pull that pull lever. Pull it down. Wow! There goes the coal. Look at that. Boom! OK, we've watched the coal get loaded at the mine. We've hauled it over the line. Now we've unloaded it here. Randy, I want to go see what you guys do with this coal. The coal travels along a conveyor belt to a holding facility until it's ready to be turned into electricity. One train load can generate 36 million kilowatts, enough to power 170 homes for a month. We take that coal, put it into a silo for storage, then we grind the coal to a very fine powder, and then we blow it into the furnace. Would you like to see where we burn it? You burn it right here? This entire building, about a 10-story building, is the furnace. And the coal goes in. We have about 250 miles of tubing where we have water in the tubing and we make steam. Would you like to see inside? I have a feeling you're going to show me, so yeah. These furnaces generate electricity for over one million households. I can see it glowing in there right now. It's like a pink glow through that window right here. All right, I've got an observation port. You can see we've got some protective glass and some air that's cooling that port right now, and you can see the fireball through the glass. Let's open it up. Wow! That's seriously hot coal-fired power. That hissing sound, what was that? Was that the... That was some seal air that we were using to help protect you and shield you from the heat. OK, yeah. what if that wasn't there? If that wasn't there, you'd be experiencing a lot of that heat be coming out from the boiler. How hot is the fire in this furnace? Matt, we're burning at over 1,500 degrees inside the furnace. You're telling me there's a thin wall between me and just being cooked alive? Absolutely, but you're very safe. We've got a lot of tubing, a lot of insulation. You're safe standing right here. Uh, you're making me feel good. They burn 13,000 tons of coal a day. That's one train a day. So, Mike, it's going to be absolutely essential that you get the trains in here. Without the train, I don't have the fire. I'm not generating steam and ultimately not making electricity. Amazing. This is what it's all about. These generators bring power to over 1 million homes every year. All right, the last car is empty, and the lights are still on in Pennsylvania, thanks to all the hardworking people along this rail line.